with your sweet and mighty spirit, Lord, just hovering over the place with the atmosphere, Lord, that I feel. Lord, I feel in my spirit this morning, Lord, a sense of urgency. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. A heavy heart, oh, Lord, for those today who are heavy burdened, Lord, those today, God, that come in empty and depleted. Lord, I know that you're passing by, Lord. You're here even now. Holy Spirit, I pray today, God, that our spirits be quickened within us to reach out for you. I thank you, Lord, that you never hide from the oppressed. Lord, that you're always near, never too busy, never too preoccupied. Holy Spirit, as I come before you this morning, Lord, I do so in humble acknowledgement, Lord, that I'm nothing. Apart from you, I can do nothing, Lord. There's no words even that I can speak, God, except you have given my vocal cords the ability to bring words to life. Father, my prayer today, Lord, is that it would be your words and not the words of a man. Lord, as I present myself, Lord, I simply do so as a tool in the Master's hand. My prayer today, God, is that you would use me as such, however you see fit for your glory. Let it be you and you alone that's seen and glorified in this place today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Romans, the sixth chapter. The title of the message this morning is Bury the Old Man. I wanted to preach on something else. Still going to talk on baptism, but the Holy Spirit has been dealing with me all week long. I keep coming back to this text. And this morning, the heaviness of the Lord has been dealing with my heart just on the reality of us dabbling in sin and trying to be okay with it. And we don't understand the nature of it. And God began to impress upon my spirit as a father myself. I would not be okay with a child that was battling cancer unresolved. I wouldn't be okay for them to go through a few treatments, having lost their hair and knowing that the cancer's not gone, but the doctor says, hey, I got good news, at least their hair's growing back. You know, I don't care about the outward appearance. I want to deal with the condition. And this is what God has been pricking my heart this morning. Too many of us have gotten caught up with the outward appearance and we think because we look better than we used to as Christians that somehow we're okay. And God's trying to deal with the condition of our heart today. I believe that God is going to call some of us back to reaffirming a commitment. To truly burying the old man. Getting beyond the outward appearance of going to church and the outward appearance of religion. And, and looking better than we used to be. And God is calling us, I believe, as a, as a church body to a wholehearted commitment. And some of us, quite frankly, we need to, to bury the old man. No more dragging him around. I, I like the fact that Paul used that illustration. He said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? The Roman form of punishment was for a murderer to tote around the body of the one that he had killed until it literally just began to stink and rot and, and rot and eat into his own flesh and ultimately kill him. The best thing to do is bury that old man, get rid of him. Stop toting him around. I want to open up with this story. True story. An evangelist told the story of how he himself was saved. He was a blacksmith. He said, the toughest, roughest blacksmith in the shop was Tom. Big Tom, everybody called him. He was not only the strongest man in the shop, but he was also the most wicked man that I knew. He was feared by every man, even by his own family. And he, in turn, was afraid of no one or anything. His fellow blacksmiths learned to give him a wide berth on Monday mornings when he came to work without having fully recovered from the weekend of drunkenness or any other morning for that matter because he might be in a bad mood. One morning, Tom came into the shop with a smile and a word of greeting for us all, and this astonished each of us. He made the announcement that he had gone to an evangelistic service the night before and had received the Savior as his own. He said, men, I am now a Christian, said Tom. I attend 
I intend to be different than you have known me. I want to be loyal and true to the Lord Jesus Christ. No one dared dispute his statement, but the men looked at one another with knowing glances. So big time got religion. They thought it won't last, they thought. Among themselves, they began to lay wagers at times Christianity would not last until noon, but it did. He was diligent in his work, kind and gracious to all. Then there were bets laid that he wouldn't be able to go past the tavern on his way home, but he did. As the marvel of Tom's new life continued to be shown to them, the other blacksmiths shook their head in amazement, but secretly they made further wages that Saturday night they'd find Tom dead drunk in some saloon. And they were wrong. The big blacksmith took his pay envelope and his dinner pail and walked past every den of iniquity straight to his home and to his happy family. On Monday morning, he witnessed all in the shop about what he'd heard the preacher say during the Sunday services. Morning and evening, every man and boy in the blacksmith shop began to believe that Big Tom had really become a Christian. Then one day it happened. Tom was fashioning a piece of red hot iron, and in a striking blow he hit his thumb as well as the iron. The tremendous oath such as only Tom could swear turned all the air blue. He said, every one of us stood stark in still amazement and in sorrow, as I'm sure every eye was on Tom. He paid no attention whatsoever to any of us. He could have made light of the matter and laughed it off, and we might have joined him timidly in laughter. He might have lowered his glance at us and shook his fist, but he did nothing of the kind. Instead, he fell to his knees immediately, bowing his massive head upon the anvil. He buried his face in his hands, and we heard the deep sobbing of the depths of his heart and saw the heaving of that great chest and bitter tears that flowed between his grimy fingers. For several minutes he remained in prayer, weeping. Then he arose from his knees, wiping the tears from his cheeks. He smiled at each of us and said, Fellows, I want you to forgive me. I did not mean to swear. The Savior has forgiven me, and please forgive me also. In subdued silence we nodded to big time, and then solemnly we went each one back to his own task. It was that side of Tom on his knees publicly asking the Lord Jesus for forgiveness that touched my heart so deeply that I could not rest that evening until shortly soon after I too accepted Jesus as my Savior. I believe that God wants to leave His watermark on each of us in such a fashion that it truly impacts those around us. You may not be as mean as Wicked is big time. But there ought to be a notable change in your life. It, it grips my heart this morning. How many folks come to church and they find religion but there's no change. They find church and, and, and the routine changes but there's no change from the inside. Friend, my heart breaks because that is not biblical truth. You've missed it. God doesn't want to make you better. He wants to make you new. He doesn't want to improve your life. He wants to give you a new life. C.S. Lewis said, If conversion to Christianity makes no improvement in a man's outward actions, if he continues to be just as snobbish, spiteful, evil, envious, or ambitious as he was before, then I think we must suspect that his conversion was largely imaginary. Romans 6, beginning with verse 3. And I read this last week. It says, Know ye not, don't you know, that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death, therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the death, died no more. Death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died into sin once. But in that he lived, he lived unto God. Likewise, reckon or know that you also are to be dead indeed to sin. 
dead indeed, absolutely, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin that will reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. And Paul then goes ahead preemptively and and answers the question that many still today believe the lie for themselves. Shall we continue to sin that grace would abound? He says, because we're not under law but under grace, God forbid. Don't you know that who you yield yourself servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience to righteousness? Paul said, should we continue to dabble in sin? Should we continue to play with it? Should we continue to to come to church and live like we used to live? Is that the way that our life is to reflect the, the newness of life that Christ has given us? He said, absolutely not. He said, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Your mem- that's, that's your little finger. That's your tongue. Don't, don't use Your members as instruments, don't don't give them to the devil to use to corrupt the very nature that God is trying to impart into you. But instead, submit them all from the smallest of digits, the smallest member of your body. Use it to the glorifying of God. I heard a man say this to a fellow that came out of church and cussed another person out. He said, did you praise God with that same mouth? Does it matter what you look like when you leave church? Does it matter the actions that you take? Because this is what Jesus was saying. He said, I I don't want you to be alive to sin any longer. I, I don't want you to be a slave to sin. As a matter of fact, I've come to die for that. And I've given you a place to bury the old man so you don't have to tote him around the rest of your life. You can walk in the newness of life. Let me ask you this question. If you buried someone yesterday, would you expect to see them walking around the the house today? Then why is it that so many of us still walk around and we say that that old man is buried? We still walk around looking the same. Here's one thing. I'm not the smartest guy, but here's one thing I do know Dead men don't have an agenda. Dead men don't harbor grudges. Dead men don't remember all the pain that was inflicted upon them and hold it against others. Dead men don't quit. Dead men don't really care what other people think of them. I want to know this morning, have you died to sin? Has God made you truly alive in Christ? If not, we need to bury the old man. See, I preached to you last week, the problem is sin. And sin's still our problem today. The only way to deal with sin is just like cancer, is to kill it. I'm certain that I'm not the only one that would not be content just to have my child's hair grow back and and that they look healthy, but knowing that something is still alive on the inside of them that's utterly going to destroy them. I'm not okay with that. God's not okay with you having something alive on the inside of you that's utterly going to destroy you. Sin is still the problem today. Sin separates us from God. God says it's not enough that, that you, you, you're doing better. It's not enough that we've got 99% of the cancer out of your body. I don't think there's anybody in this building that would be content with the doctor saying, look, we got all but one cancer cell. You'd plead with the doctor, what, what do we have to do to get that one last cell? I want it dead. I want to be rid of this thing. The the only way to deal with sin today is to kill it, not to make excuses for it any longer. Let let me meddle for a moment because this is too often what we do. We make excuses to continue to live with sin. Well, you know, I'm not perfect, Pastor. Why, Why should I even try? You know, God will forgive me. I'm much better than I used to be. 
None of those things matter. The only way to deal with it is to kill it, to get rid of it. You say, Pastor, it's just not that easy. Oh, but it is. The Bible says that Jesus made a public spectacle of it. For you and I to believe that, that the power of God is not able to rid you of that old wicked nature is to believe the lie of the enemy because the Bible makes it very clear that God made a public spectacle of it, that, that He has made you and I free from it. You don't have to be bound with it any longer. Now, I'm not suggesting to you that you're going to be perfect this morning. But I'm telling you that when we have been baptized... In the Christ. Listen, you may have been baptized this morning previous to now. And I want to deal with a couple of things we're going to teach a little bit this morning. But the only way to deal with sin is to kill it. It must die. That sin nature has to die. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, I didn't give you the scripture, but it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Can I tell you that sin is a choice? Sin before the Lord is much less the actions and much more the intentions. You ever accidentally walked into the wrong bathroom? Your intentions were not wrong. Is that a criminal thing when you do that? No, your intentions were not wrong. Your heart was in the right place. You, you just step. Sin is not so much the action as it is the intention. Sometimes you're going to let your tongue get ahead of you and you're going to say things that offend other people, but you're going to be like big time. And you're going to buckle under the conviction that God puts on your heart. Because when He makes you new again, He's not going to leave that old sin nature there to prevail. He's not going to let it run rampant. I, I'm telling you the honest to God truth. When God changes your life, the things that didn't bother you that morning will bother you that night. I'm talking about bothering a grown man like big Tom that never cries, bothering him until he's in tears, weeping publicly before others. Sin must die. Listen. In baptism, I'm going to do a little bit of teaching and I'll get back to this. You know, we don't bury living people in order to kill them. Let me say that one more time. We don't bury living people in order to kill them. We bury those who are already dead. We don't baptize people in order to rid them of their sin. We baptize people who have already died to that sin, and we bury them. What, what I preached to you last week was the very first gospel message. And when Peter preached that message, conviction fell, and those men cried out, What shall we do? What did he say? Repent, and then be baptized. When, when you repent, and you'll, you'll kill that old fleshly nature before God, then we can give you a place to bury it. Now, I fully under, understand that if we bury something, there's fina finality there. It's the end of it. Amen? This is the place that we can go back and, and memorialize what used to be. But I don't expect you to bury something. Go back there and dig it up and drag it around with you. Amen? So there are many people that have been baptized and they thought that it washed their sins away. Baptism doesn't do it. It's a picture of washing the sins away. But the water doesn't actually do that. Are you with me? What can wash away your sin? Baptism is a picture of what God has done. But in and of itself, it does not do that. What I'm telling you is that being baptized does not save a man or woman. But there are many today. This, I'm going to do a little bit of teaching this morning. The water's not magical. What makes it right is that when you, you kneel before the Lord with a repentant heart, saying, God, I will not go back. Lord, I don't want to live like this any longer. God, I'm not going to be a slave to that sin any longer. What is baptism? Baptism is an is a outward display of an inward change. But it's also more than that. It is an act of obedience. The Word of God says that we are to be baptized. Even Jesus was baptized. When John said, look, I'm not worthy to baptize you, he said, look, you've got to do it. It has to happen. 
After he was baptized, he was led away into the wilderness. That's where his ministry began. Because it was in that moment that even for you and I, that he was putting that old sin nature in the grave. Before he went to Calvary, he was already dealing with the sin nature. Before he could even accomplish his earthly ministry, before he could even allow God to do in him what God had created him to do, he had to first deal with that flesh. I know that Jesus was sinless, but he was dying for you and I. He had to deal with the flesh before he'd go on that mission field. He'd have to deal with the flesh before he even got to Calvary's Hill. You and I are commanded to be baptized. When we act in obedience to this by faith, there's a couple of things that has to happen. If that baptism is going to mean anything, it has to be an act of obedience, for one, to the Word of God. For two, there must be faith that even beyond what you can see, God is doing something in the spiritual realm. And there has to be repentance. There's nothing magical about the water, but when you go in by faith with a repentant heart, you'll find that God truly washes away those sins. The Bible says that we are buried with Christ. We go into that water just like you're going lowered into the ground. Before you're buried, you get lowered into it. Amen. You're you're as dead men walking. You walk out of there. You're covered. You're buried with that. But the good news is you don't stay under the water. We've yet to hold anybody long enough to to keep them down. Every single one of them, we've got 100% success rate. Every single one of them makes it out. But I believe that if you'll let God have his way with you, that what comes out won't be the same thing that went in. Now, you and I may not be able to see it with fleshly eyes, but I'm telling you it ought to be like big time. I'm telling you what God does in your life. God will wash away the sin. God will cause that, dead, that, that old nature to be buried right there in that water. And the good news is you'll have a place to take the devil back to one day. Because he may not forget and he may never let you forget what God has chosen not to remember. So what is baptism? Baptism is that it is truly by definition it is complete surrender unto God. So not my will but yours. Again, dead men don't have agendas. Lord, the moment that I came and gave my life to you, Lord, it was no longer about me. I I died that day to self, truly. I've told you before, the only reason that I'm pastoring today isn't for a paycheck, but I died to self. I, I do what God has called me to do, not because necessarily it was my plan or my agenda. But dead men have no agenda. This is what God wants to do in our life. Listen, the water's not magical. But it is a place of commitment to God. It is, like I told you, like a signing of the contract for marriage. In order for you to have a valid marriage, there must be a piece of paper. The ring is not what unites a man and a woman. There's a little piece of paper that gets filed with the courthouse. Your marriage license gets put on file someplace. That's the thing that legitimizes When we enter into this covenant with God, this act of obedience, this legitimizing, if you will, that relationship, it draws a line in the sand and says, whatever I was yesterday, I'm no longer. Do you realize even at the marriage altar, a man and woman come in one way, but they leave out completely different? Everything changes in a moment. For the bride, which we are the bride, the moment that they say their vows. There's a status change and a name change. Everything changes in an instant. When when we are baptized with Christ, the Bible says that we are grafted in. I, I explained that covenant, but the two shall become one, just like at the marriage altar. Well, the two of us become one. You are united with God through Christ Jesus. The moment that you get saved, the moment that you surrender your life completely to God, the moment you go in and you enter that covenant of baptism, there is instantly a name change, instantly a status change, instantly everything changes and transforms. It may not look like anything's different. When I walked out of my wedding, I looked the same as I did coming in, but everything about my life had changed. It was no longer about me, it was about us. My status had changed. Everything about my life would be transformed and it would all center on that one defining moment. 
We just celebrated last week or, or, or memorialized, if you will, 9-11. How many of you remember where you were at that day? There are certain events in life that define moments. And there are certain events that we intentionally have in our life that define moments. And marriage is one of those. If a man gets married, a woman gets married, their status changes instantly, their life changes instantly. But does that mean that they'll never be tempted again? Absolutely not. Does that marriage certificate, does the wedding ring, does that prevent them from ever being unfaithful? No. It doesn't mean that they won't be tempted. It doesn't mean they won't go through struggles. All that is, is it's a defining moment in their life. When temptation comes, you remember those vows. And listen, if you're married long enough, I promise you, temptation will come. But you'll have one of those defining moments when temptation comes. You'll remember that I have pledged my love and my devotion to another. You'll flash back to that defining moment, that, that memorial stone where you'll say, Listen, this is where everything about my life changed. Everything revolves around that one moment where I said, I do at that altar. When you come before Christ in baptism, it doesn't mean that you'll never be tempted again. It doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go through struggles. But when the devil comes knocking on your door, you've got to remember the vow that you've made. You've got to remember, listen, everything changed that day. That was the day that I said, I will not be a slave to sin any longer. This is what he means that, that you're not a slave. This is what it means that, he, that he's going to deliver you from that body of death. That's the day that you bury that old man. You take away its right from you to let you do what you want to do, what will satisfy and gratify the flesh. Even as an unsaved man, I, I have been faithful to my wife before I was saved. And it comes back to the vow that I made. You may be tempted by things, but you'll have that marker. It's more than just a church service. Listen, I had been to weddings before, but I wasn't married. You can go to a wedding. That doesn't mean you're married. You can have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. That doesn't mean you're married. It's amazing how that, that one moment defines everything. There's a reason that a lot of people are afraid to, to actually go before that altar. It's something about that commitment they're about to make. They don't mind shacking up for years, but that commitment seems to frighten them. Because they understand, I'm going to have to look at that face to face. Anytime temptation comes my way, I'm going to have to pass that marker. When the devil comes knocking on your door, this is what baptism is. It's that marker in the stand that says, listen, I have surrendered my life to God. I have pledged my faithfulness, my love, my devotion unto Him. I want to deal with a couple of issues this morning. Should we be rebaptized? If there's not been a change in your life, I think you need to be rebaptized. Pastor Mark, I'm not sure. I, I was baptized long ago. If the Holy Spirit convicts you, I think you need to be rebaptized. I don't think it's wrong for a husband and wife who are legitimately married to rededicate their vows. I think it's a beautiful affair. There's nothing wrong with it. I've had the honor to Perform those ceremonies before with couples that were not saved when they got married. And as a result, their, their marriage didn't start out on the right foot. But after they got saved, they said, Pastor, we want to renew our vows this time before God. It, it, does that make them any more married? No. Was it wrong of them? No. I believe it was absolutely right. Another issue that I want to deal with this morning, and this may be offensive to some, and that's okay. I don't believe it's good practice to baptize young children. Now, I know we have them in the video. Hear me this morning. I'm the pastor of the church, but you're the priest of the home. I believe young children can make a wholehearted commitment to the Lord. But here's what I know. Most of us have very sincere hearts when we're young. We have the best of intentions. We have true fear before the Lord. But somewhere between that young age and 16, 17, 18, oftentimes those convictions are drastically different maybe this is just personal conviction 
I was baptized at about eight years old at a church camp because all the other kids were doing it. I didn't even realize what a big deal it was till I got home and the preacher made a big deal out of it. I remember he called me up front. Nobody's even explained to me. Well, if they did, I didn't remember or was too young to understand. Here's my conviction in it. It meant nothing. But for many, many of my peers growing up, because they had been water baptized, they thought they were right with God. I pray that you know better. Water doesn't save anyone. But I think sometimes we do an injustice. You know, children can get married at a very young age as long as you'll sign the consent form. Why don't we let our kids get married at 13 and 14 like they used to? Oh, pastor, they're not, they're not ready for that. I agree. Let them mature a little bit. My youngest daughter will be 13 in December. She's not yet been baptized. I believe she's on her way to heaven. If the Lord calls her home today, I'm not worried about her not having the opportunity to be dunked in water yet. See, in biblical days, the only ones that were baptized were those that were able to make the decision for themselves, not someone making it for them. Now, I say all that to say this. While that's my conviction, you still have to be the priest of your home. I'm not going to die on that hill. If you're adamant that your child is a professing believer and ready to be baptized, then I'll honor that. Pastor Jeff and I have already talked, instructed him. I said, there's children on there. I want you to talk to the children and as well as the parents. And if they're not ready, listen, I'm not going to baptize you. Or a child if they're not ready. But I believe today that God wants us to deal with the issue in our life. Not playing games any longer. John chapter 12. It's a different kind of sermon for me this morning but heavy on my heart. John chapter 12, verse 24. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abide alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that love his life shall lose it, and he that hate his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. What I read for you earlier is that we're to walk in the newness of life. He said, if any man serve me, let him follow me. Let him walk in that newness of life. Christ has died for more than a mediocre religion. Christ died for you and I to have the newness of life. To be like Big Tom. From one day to the next, a transformed man. The power of God is able to change your life, to give you more than religion, to give you more than a a sacrament, to give you more than water baptism. God wants to change and transform your life. If you'll allow God to do that, then you ought to be water baptized, having a place that you can go and bury that old man so the devil can get off your back once and for all. Because the Bible says that once we've died to sin, then we die no more. Sin's been conquered at that point. Well, that means, listen, if... What else can you do to a dead man, even if he's a criminal? Can you enforce justice on the dead? If a man robs a bank, but by the time we realize and he's already dead, what, what can you do to him? The wages of sin is death, but the, glory, the, the glorious good news is that Christ already paid that price for you and I. He said, if If a seed remains, it has no life. But if that seed will die to self, it will not only have life, but it will produce fruit. Let me give you a couple of things to think about. You can go to the store and buy little bags of seed. A seed in a bag is quite comfortable, but it's useless. 
if you're going to let God have his way, you're going to have to let God take you out of your comfort zone. Get you out of the place that you can control everything. What a wonderful position to be in that there's no expectation, no obligation. That seed has so much potential. But as long as it remains in that little pack, it will never produce anything. And you take that seed out of the pack and you throw it on the ground and the sun will scorch it. And there are many Christians today, that's where they're at. They finally got out of their comfort zone, started letting God deal with their life, but they're not ready to put down roots yet, not ready to lose their life for the sake of Christ. They'll come in, sit in a church service. And life gets hot and it scorches that seed. That seed won't grow. Even when the water comes, guess what the water will do? It will hit that seed and flow right off. The only way for that seed to produce life is for that dirt to cover it up. The only way for that seed to produce anything is for it to get lost in something bigger than it is. The only way for you and I to truly find life is to let Jesus Christ cover our life altogether. Where it's no longer about you. It's no longer about people seeing you. It's no longer about your feelings. No longer about your agenda. No, matter, no more about your hurt and your pain and how many people have done you wrong and what they've said. And all the stuff you'll have to give up. The only way for that seed to ever amount to anything is for the glory of God to cover it up. And guess what? The only thing that's seen from then on is the soil. But you know what the beautiful thing is? Is inside of that seed there is life. Isn't it wonderful to know that that seed doesn't come out looking like the same thing it went in? When that water begins to hit that seed that's covered up in Christ. Listen, this is what I believe baptism is to you and I. I believe we finally fully surrender our life to Jesus Christ. It's like that seed that's been covered up in Christ, been covered up in the soil, but now I need a little bit of water. God, if you'll apply this one last element to my life, God, I'm completely submitting to you. I completely surrender my will to yours. And God, I pray today, oh Lord, that what would be birthed from this is a new creation in Christ Jesus. That seed goes in so small, and the next time you see it, it won't look anything like it did the last time you saw it. The next time you see it it'll be green it'll be vibrant it'll begin to grow it'll put down roots hear me this morning this is where some of us are at we've been surface level Christians not willing to let Jesus Christ cover us not willing to let him have our whole life and as a result we sit there and bake in the heat we can take it for a while but every time things get difficult every time the wind blows we're blown this way and that way every time things get heated up we're ready to check out we're ready to move on. But see, if it will let God cover us up where all of a sudden it doesn't matter about your feelings. Hear me this morning. There's nobody in this church who's had their feelings hurt by people in this church more than this man standing here today. Can I be honest with you and tell you, if the Lord had not put roots down in this place for me, I would have gladly left years ago. I'm not looking for a place to go this morning. That's in no means a, a threat or intimidation. I'm just telling you as a matter of fact, when you get covered up in Jesus Christ, it's no longer about you. It doesn't matter what's happened to you, who's done you wrong. It doesn't matter what your plans are. It doesn't matter what your retirement plans are, Pastor Mark. I've called you to something bigger than you are, and what will come out of this thing will be bigger than you ever dreamed it could be because I'll not only give you life but I'll give you fruit that will produce life to other generations. God wants to do the same thing in your life and some of you, you got family members today that need to see the glory of God revealed in you and through you and not just talk. Stand with me all over the house this morning. It says, now if we be dead with Christ we believe that we shall also live with Him knowing that Christ, knowing how many of you know this morning that Christ rose from the dead? How many of you know that on the third day that stone was rolled away? It was God that rolled it away. The angel of the Lord rolled it away. That third day, the tomb was empty and Christ lives and yet He lives even still now. I know that I know that if I surrender my life to Christ, I will not lose it. I know that I know that I know this morning that there's no sacrifice that I can make that's truly a sacrifice. All I'm doing is investing in eternity. All I'm doing is storing up treasures for myself in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy. Listen, some of you are worried about the stock market because you're invested in the wrong thing. Hear me this morning. My 401k may not look like what it did when I worked in the secular world, but I want to tell you my retirement is still out of this world. Amen? Just like yours. God wants to do something in your life. But the only way for that to happen is you to truly surrender to God and let Him have His way wholeheartedly. 
every head bowed, every eye closed. Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead unto sin, but alive, alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Say, devil, you can take me off the list. I'm not going to serve you any longer. I'm not going to be on the fence any longer. Galatians 2.20 says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live it by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to invite you to come this morning. I want to invite you all over the house today. I want you to come. Find a spot at these altars this morning. And ask God, Lord, search my heart today. Lord, I want that living water, God, to penetrate that seat. Lord, I need a new life, God. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be lukewarm, God. I don't want to be middle of the road, God. I want to be wholeheartedly invested in you. All over the house. Come and find a spot this morning and pray. Next week is baptism. I'm praying that God would do what only He can do. My prayer is that God would transform lives. I know that if God will touch a life, it'll be seen outside the walls of this church. I know that if God will touch a life, their family will begin to see. Their co-workers will begin to see. Some of you this morning, you're troubled by so many things because you're not allowed God to completely cover you. All over the house find you a spot to pray this morning I plead with you God wants to deal with the issues in our life and it's not just this church but the church itself the body of Christ has fallen asleep the body of Christ has been lukewarm at best and we're pleading the blood of Jesus Christ pleading for revival God's saying the only way to revival is to bury the old man. That I might bring forth a new creation. Worship in this morning, church. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Oh! 
adore you. of your name. Proclaim it with us this morning. Oh, Jesus, your name is power. Breath the living water. Such a marvelous mystery. Oh, yeah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is with all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will oh come on lift up your hands and sing it with us holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come creation I sing praise to the King of Kings you are my everything and I will adore oh, you sing holy 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come with all creation Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Oh, come on, lift up your hands and just love on Him right now. Oh, we adore you, Lord. You're worthy, yes, you're worthy. We magnify your holy name. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, I thank you that you're working all things for our good this morning, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we bless your name, Holy Spirit. Fill this room right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. Holy Spirit, I thank you, God. I thank you for your word. I pray, God, that your, your word would go forth today. Well, even beyond the walls of this church. Lord, I know that your desire today, God, is to cover us completely. That we might find the life that you have died to give us through surrendering to you. I pray today that your Holy Spirit would snatch some from off the fence. Who have tried to straddle the fence this morning living in a place of compromise, a place of comfort. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would snatch them from off the fence, Lord, for your glory. That your word would bring such love and conviction, God, that it would drive them to their knees in repentance. Father, I'm praying and I'm believing, God, for new life, Lord, in baptism. Lord, for a line being drawn in the sand, God, for a place of remembrance, Lord, of our love, our devotion unto you. No more looking back. No more slave to sin sold out to you 
Lord, I pray today, God, a blessing over these, your people. I pray, God, not only would you bless them, but bless the word, Lord, that's been sown into their heart today. I thank you and praise you that your word will not return void. I pray, God, that you'd continue, Lord, to bring about loving conviction to all those, Lord, who need it. Father, I praise you, Lord, for your transforming power, Lord. And I pray today that that living water would flow over this seed, God, and begin to produce life in abundance, Lord, in each of us. That the world around us, our families, our friends, God, and those that see would take note of the glory of God. Lord, may you bless these, your people, this day as we depart from the house of the Lord. In peace, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.